What constitutes a crime in North Carolina isn't really as obvious as you'd think. So how can that be? Our next guest links the confusion to an antiquated and ineffective criminal code that spread across a hundred chapters of the North Carolina General Statutes. In a recent piece published in the North State Journal, Mike Sheetzelt, who is the John Locke Foundation's legal fellow, focused on two examples that illustrate the point that we've got a lot of work to do in this regard. Mike, welcome back to the program. Thank you. First, explain to us what is the criminal code when we say that. So when, at least when I'm writing about the criminal code, and I think the way most people understand the criminal code is what is a crime in in North Carolina? What allows the criminal justice system to punish you for um, violating one of these laws for engaging in prescribed behavior, that proscribed behavior, the banned behavior? You're not just talking about breaking and entering or violent crime. You're talking right. about anything in in state law or state code that says that uh, you could be held legally accountable for doing something that uh, the state has said is illegal. Absolutely. And there's a handful of sources of that. Um, we all think of Chapter 14 and the, the criminal chapter of the general statutes. But as you mentioned, there's well over 100 chapters of the general statutes that contain crimes within them. Um, you have agency rules that are passed by various departments in the executive branch that are criminalized by more general um, statutes. Then you have ordinances, local ordinances, that are made criminal by default, unless the local body makes them not criminal. And you have some crimes, like some of the ones you mentioned, that are defined by the common law, which means judicial opinions. They're not defined by Um, statute or by ordinance or anything. They're not written down except in judicial opinions. This, I think, is pretty fascinating because you are an attorney. I am not an attorney. And I'm thinking when I hear the word crime, obviously in in a civil, um, peaceful society, you know that to go knock someone over the head with a baseball bat would be a crime. Right. Uh, You know that um, stealing someone's car would be a crime. But how is someone like me, supposed to know what is a crime if it's not in the area of a violent offense? That's one of the problems we're working on. Um, What constitutes proper notice of what is criminal behavior? Um, And a lot of times there's just, there's really no way to know. It would be an all-consuming task to try and find out what's criminal in your area. Uh, And we've seen, particularly in our study of local ordinances, that there are just some crazy things out there that can be punished with a a class three misdemeanor um, for not having a screen on a window in your house that you use to open and close. That could be... That's crazy. uh, That's crazy. Having a a stale bird bath out in the yard that is a breeding ground for mosquitoes or an old tire that's laying out there. Having grass that grows too tall. And whether that's Um, 10 or 12 inches in some localities or 24 inches in other localities, having too many dogs on your property. There are a lot of things that are criminalized and it's different from county to county, from town to town. You have more than 600 counties and municipalities added up together and they have more than 600 opinions on what should be criminal. This is why you're focusing on this um, here at the John Locke Foundation because um, not only are they antiquated in some cases crazy, but they're different all over the place. So there's really um, all this collection from over years and years and years and you have been trying to get uh, policymakers to kind of focus on this and say we can make this better. We can make it more understandable. We can maybe cut out some of the things that we can now decide don't really need to be a crime and things like that. You wrote a really fascinating piece uh, published in North State Journal, and you gave us a couple of examples of how this can be unfair to people in very interesting ways. Talk to us a little bit about what happened in Greensboro with the the woman who was charged with felony littering. Right. Um, So that's that's a very interesting case because here you had clear wrongdoing that went unpunished. Um, There was a woman who had found a a scrap metal tank, and the scrap metal tank had some sort of liquid in it that made it hard to move. Uh, So she dumped it out, not realizing that it was heating oil. So um, to try and avoid some of the technicalities, what she challenged when she went to trial on this, she was charged with felony littering for dumping heating oil and costing uh, Guilford County more than $10,000 to clean it up. she tried to argue that I, I didn't know that this was heating oil and therefore I didn't have what we call mens rea, the guilty mindset. 
um, uh, that, that should be required under the statute. The court didn't buy that argument, so she took a different line of attack at the Court of Appeals. Um, there's a technicality in North Carolina law that allows you to challenge your indictment at any point. The indictment is the, the ticket that the prosecutor has to have to get you into court. It gives the court power over you. And so you can challenge it at any point. And she challenged it on appeal and wound up winning on appeal, saying, well, they left out an, an, an element that had no bearing on her case at all. Um, so in this instance, um, a, a technicality, or sorry, a, um, an ambiguity in the law allowed her to challenge it at court. She lost there, challenged a different technicality, in, or, or even an, ambigu- an ambiguous technicality in the law at, uh, on, or on appeal, and wound up getting a second bite at the apple to go back and have another trial and drag this process out. That's not fair, and it's not uh, appropriately treating wrongdoers when, when we allow them to take advantage of these loopholes in the law. So that's that's that case and essentially how that wound up working its way through so the court. So one of your efforts then when you talk about trying to urge policymakers to review all of these things and to say, do we need this or do we not, is to eliminate all all of that ambiguity so that it becomes very clear what the law is and you either break it or you don't. Right. And it's impossible to remove every ambiguity. The language is always going to be ambiguous to some extent. You can't foresee every instance that's going to pop up. But to the extent possible, our criminal law needs to have bright lines so that people know, what can I do? What can't I do? That line needs to be apparent to everyone. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about notice. Now, you also write in your piece for North State Journal about the case, um, this one also out of Guilford County, where you had um, essentially a tap room that got in in trouble, ran afoul of the law. They didn't really even know what was going on and had to do with allowing dogs inside? Yes. So Joy Mongers is a very popular establishment in Greensboro. I've been there myself, and it's, it's a great atmosphere where people can go in, have a beer, they bring their dogs. And um, they didn't apparently didn't think that they were a food establishment under the health code because they didn't serve any food. But because of the way food establishment was defined, uh, the, the Guilford County Health Department came in and said, you can't allow these dogs in. That's a class three or class two misdemeanor or whatever. I can't remember which. But um, they... they, they gave them basically a cease and desist order on these the allowing the dogs in and that created a huge public outcry so what happened in response to the public outcry well in response to the public outcry they decided well we're just not going to push this right now and we'll uh put everything on hold until maybe we can get a legislative fix and i think that the biggest issue there is that's um it undermines the rule of law it undermines the rule of law when we say, okay, well, county officials, you know, this is the law, but we're just not going to prosecute it because it turns out this was crazy and maybe it shouldn't have been a crime to begin with. And so you allow the crimes to be defined by public opinion. And that doesn't seem to be the best way to go about punishing wrongdoers is whether or not the public thinks they have committed some sort of a wrong. And your point, um, also in a lot of your writings on this, is that it's up to the legislature, and not the public, but the legislature doing the work of the people who've elected them to take a look at this, to review this. And in fact, the legislature has kind of started into this process. Give us an update. So right now, the legislature, uh, they passed a bill last year that was seeking more information from cities and counties about um, what's a crime in their local jurisdictions. Not everybody responded. So they've pushed... Now, this session, they, they seem to be pushing towards getting more of that information in. And with that information, what we can do is we can uh, push a recodification commission to rewrite the criminal laws and create those bright lines and have it make more sense.